Well, welcome everyone again um, to another great AMA Boston webinar. Thanks for joining us on this uh, lunchtime hour. Hopefully, um, I know this will be a great presentation. Um, uh, today's presenters from WSI, I'll let them introduce themselves shortly thereafter, including uh, Peter, who's on our AMA Boston board. Peter, do you wanna keep going to the next slide? So for those of you who maybe joined a little later, um, I'm Megan McGrath, the president of AMA Boston this year. Uh, nice to meet you virtually. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or um, message me if you want to get involved. Happy to connect with local marketers and I'd love to meet everyone in our community. Um, AMA Boston is the networking and educational hub for really New England marketers. We cover Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and all parts of Massachusetts, though our chapter name is Boston. Um, we'd encourage you to keep coming to these events. We're going to continue to be virtual for a while, but they've been a lot of fun. Uh, we have our Marketing Mingle, which is a networking event every second Thursday of the month, and usually we have educational panels every fourth Thursday of the month. We'll be telling you about other upcoming events that we have um, planned. We have a bunch in October um, and some in September as well. Um, and it's a great time to join. Uh, we, we fought hard to get National to drop the membership price this year. So more affordable um, and we'd really encourage you to become a part of the community. It's really important to be, stay involved in communities during this time and uh, I think it's good for everyone. So you want to move on Peter? So briefly this is just our 2020-2021 board. Um, if you'd like to get involved or volunteer this is a great time to do that. We'd appreciate your support or just feel free to keep coming to events. Um, and feel free to connect with us as well. I know some of the VPs that you see on the screen here will throw their information in the chat, um, and I'd encourage you to do that as well, just so that we continue to get to know one another in a virtual environment. All right, so just quick housekeeping. Uh, I, I asked this at the beginning, but uh, normally we just ask that you take yourself on mute and off of video until the end when we open it up to Q&A, we'll, we'll pull away from the slides at that point and you can interact with the, today's presenters but for now just keep yourself on mute and take the video off um, and we'll be sending around a survey at the end of this session. Um, I already mentioned that you can feel free to put your questions in the chat throughout the presentation but please do give us feedback on the survey if you have five minutes. I think it's more important than ever in this virtual environment that we know what kinds of things you need in terms of support, education, opportunities. So we're really open to feedback and we'd appreciate your thoughts. All right, Peter, over to you. I want to let you kick it off. Sure, sure. Um, so my name is uh, Peter Burson. I'm also a member of the AMA board. I'm the v current VP of technology, handle everything that around technology and mainly we're working on, on the website and enhancing our website. And part of that is working with um, members of my team like Vanish who I reach out to and helps with a lot of different things when it comes to website, SEO, and digital marketing strategy campaigns like we're gonna talk about today. Uh, Vanish has uh, many years of experience and even working with big, big brands like Coca-Cola or Salesforce or uh, WSI has been around for 25 years and one of the ones we've recently worked with was Sunsuite in the UK and developing you know, how to sell prunes into the UK market. It was something that that US company had a concern with and didn't know how to handle that and they reached out to WSI and we've been working with them for about three years now. So one of the things to help make this more interactive is we want to use this program called Menti so if you could go to men, uh, either menti.com or uh, scan that QR code, we can do our first menti poll so you can kind of get a taste of what it's like. And uh, I got to switch over to menti. And we'll get to see it. Uh, give me one second because I will share. Menti. So at this time, you should be able to start to vote on what is your tactic that you're using right now? So if you guys are all logged in, you should start to be able to see the word clouds producing. 
So it looks like SEO is, uh, let, let's get some more votes in. It seems like we only got two so far. So it seems to be the big one that I'm seeing right now is, is basically working on SEO. And that's one of the things that uh, we feel is like, yeah, the easiest thing to pick up and the least costly, the one that a lot of companies can do in-house. Uh, and now we're you know, starting to see social media. So again, that I would think that's probably organic. And we're seeing a little bit of you know, some of the paid platforms, Google Ads and paid social. Yeah, LinkedIn socials are uh, interesting. That that one's really picked on. There's a lot of uh, traction with social selling right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I would combine both the LinkedIn and the LinkedIn social selling. Yeah. Um, I, I've noticed major upticks on LinkedIn. Okay, we're going to go back to the presentation. We have more of these mentee um, uh, questions coming. And by the way, you can ask a question at any time right in that app with your phone or on your desktop. And we will then go to answer those questions at the end of the meeting. And you can upvote if it's already been asked. So I'm going to switch back to the presentation. Uh, I apologize why. I don't know why it's not allowing me to share desktop, but you know, technical thing. Uh, Vanish, back to you about our agenda. All right, terrific. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So it's, it's afternoon, and I hope everybody's having a terrific day. Um, so today's session is primarily going to be revolving around, first, uh, discussing the current marketing landscape. We're going to talk about uh, these unprecedented times that we're facing and a couple of focus areas that we should be guiding organizations on. I see a lot of people with a consultant background that have uh, signed up for this webinar today. So uh, from that perspective, we just want to educate a lot of you when it comes to uh, what are some of the pivot strategies that organizations out there are doing. Um, we deal with a lot of organizations on a day-to-day -day basis and, and uh, the information is really a compilation of uh, the data trends that we are seeing and experiencing across different uh, industries, across different verticals. So we're going to spend a few minutes on that. And then uh, we're essentially going to be hopping on to our main core focus for this particular session. And that's primarily this digital marketing blueprint framework. Now, what we've done over the years, and as Peter's mentioned, WSI has been around for uh, the, uh, for the past uh, 20 plus years. Um, we've looked at a lot of different methodologies that are out there. So you have the HubSpot inbound framework that came out in 08, 09, and HubSpot really utilized uh, or coined the phrase inbound marketing. They put out a methodology that was the whole aspect of attract, um, convert, retain, delight. And uh, then there's been the serious decisions framework for B2B organizations, uh, the whole waterfall approach that's been there uh, for, for the longest time, especially when it comes to uh, the B2B marketing side. So what we did was that we wanted to try and incorporate the best of all the different approaches that were out there. And we've come up with our approach, which is a seven step approach uh, with reference to approaching your digital marketing strategy. A lot of the times what happens is that organizations tend to go tactical. So they go straight up for tactics. They wanna jump into stuff like uh, SEO. They wanna jump into stuff like Facebook paid ads, lookalike audience targeting, uh, programmatic, uh, um, as opposed to taking a more sort of like a holistic approach, taking a step back and really planning out the entire digital uh, strategy for, for a client right from uh, the get-go. So the frameworks are really um, simplified version for an approach that we recommend organizations take. And it's, it's universally applicable. It can be applied to a BDC as well as a B2B scenario. And that's really what we wanted to share with you today in this webinar. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, you, get, you get some gold nuggets out of this session today. Uh, as Peter's mentioned, uh, the Q&A forum's uh, open. So feel free to put your questions in the chat box. Uh, I believe in the Menti panel. And then what we're gonna do is that at the end of the session, we will be queuing up uh, questions in the order that they've come in and uh, we can address uh, all of these questions. All right, terrific, let's dive right in. So 
So in terms of the impact in B2B businesses, when we're looking at uh, the um, organizations and how they're trying to really pivot the overall strategy, uh, we're essentially looking at organizations trying to really establish and solidify their cash flow when it comes to five different areas. And that's really what we are recommending organizations to do um, uh, when it comes to the, um, uh, the overall, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna get this slide back. Uh, when it comes to your overall uh, focus on cash flow, uh, cash flow became hugely important, especially with uh, COVID and a lot of organizations struggling with, with that aspect. So what we are educating organizations on is to really focus on five different areas. You really have to solidify these five areas at this stage. Uh, these primarily revolve around uh, win back approaches, win back uh, strategies. It's tougher to keep an existing customer happy or to uh, go after and uh, connect with your past customer and get them back on uh, by offering them certain promotions. Um, or uh, potentially upgrading the product, having product enhancements and positioning and pitching a product and opportunity to them. So there's definitely the uh, win back side of uh, things that can be a part of your lead pool. Um, we're also observing the fact that because of the uh, change in the landscape as far as marketing activities are concerned, trade shows essentially are, are no longer uh, in the format of the framework that they are. A lot of the sessions have pivoted to virtual uh, there's a big sort of like a scramble on the acquisition side to try and identify and find new lead sources. So from that perspective, looking at your past customers, your past database, utilizing uh, win back strategies is definitely a, a good approach to go about things. Uh, customer renewals, contract renewals has to be hand, handled really with kid gloves uh, because you want to make sure that uh, you empathize with the, with the current customer base. And if there is, uh, room for flexibility. We want to really show that at this stage and keep our customers solid because any uh, empathy or appreciation or gestures that are displayed at this stage in the time of need, uh, especially when our when our clients and our customers might be uh, facing unprecedented challenges, is going to go a long way towards creating that whole loyalty factor. Also looking at upsells. So for example, uh, just speaking with uh, Megan prior to the, the start of the webinar, the fact that uh, the uh, areas like digital transformation of organizations, which were under discussion for the longest time, have now been expedited in record time uh, because uh, th there is no other way for organizations uh, going virtual, incorporating a new tech stack uh, in order to enable um, virtual delivery of solutions and services. All of these different aspects and factors combined have really pushed organizations uh, in, in the direction of uh, upgrading their resources. And that's where the upsell opportunities come in. So we as consultants, as well as, uh, 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 as um, organizations ourselves have to constantly be looking at upsell opportunities as another revenue center for ourselves uh, so we can keep our cash flow strong. Cross selling is another area, and this is a pretty interesting one because you might have had opportunities on the sales end that were being pursued uh, or on the, on the marketing side that were being pursued uh, with other organizations or partnerships or uh, networks that were giving you a tough time uh, prior to the whole COVID situation happening. And you'd be surprised that if you approach these same individuals or organizations or networks now and talk about cross-selling opportunities or partnerships, the response that you're gonna be getting is very, very different. Everybody needs to help each other out and people that were uh, essentially closing doors in the past are very open to uh, um, uh, uh, discussions and, and collaborative efforts in order to create win-win situations across the board. So it's a really, really good time to also create some cross-sell opportunities. It's, um, it's uh, bearing a lot of dividend for organizations that are incorporating this tactic. And um, uh, from a new customer acquisition standpoint, you want to make sure that that uh, ca cash register is strong. Uh, you want to always keep your new customer acquisition pipe strong. So these are all together sort of like the five revenue centers that you want to be solidifying for organizations or for yourselves to make sure uh, that these are pumping during this, this unprecedented time and there's cash flow that's coming in from all of these different areas. So just a quick intro to our blueprint framework. We're gonna be going into each of these steps fairly extensively, but as far as the overall blueprint uh, uh, framework is concerned, we essentially start off with SMART goals. And uh, when we go into discussing SMART goals, you'll see that 
from a digital marketing standpoint, the definition of smart goals and how we approach them is a little different uh, from the typical smart goal uh, setting that takes place. Then we're going to go into personas. Then we're going to look at content mapping. We're going to look at offers. We're going to look at conversion paths. Uh, and then finally, tactics, uh, which is something that is quite interesting for organizations that are used to, uh, you know, uh, the old um, adage of like, let's throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks approach. So uh, organizations have attempted to dive right into tactics uh, as opposed to taking a step back, really doing the five steps prior to launching into tactics or tactical approaches, and then closing that off with uh, reporting and KPIs uh, in terms of what you need to have in place. So we're gonna be covering this um, as extensively as we can. Of course, there is a time limitation, uh, but uh, we'll of course try and give you as much information on these different steps as, as possible. Great, and just a reminder, if you have questions that are coming in, please uh, feel free to put the questions in the chat box. We uh, already see some pretty interesting questions that are coming in, very engaged audience. That, that's amazing, uh, loving it. And, so, and also use Menti because you can upvote people can upvote those questions and we'll display them at the end. Yeah, perfect, perfect, great, great. Awesome. Um, so in terms of smart goal setting, uh, when it comes to a digital marketing blueprint, uh, the, the two aspects that we essentially look at and focus on are one, which is really defining the lead life cycle for your organization and what that means uh, for you as an organization. We'll talk about standard lead life cycles in this in this presentation here, but the lead life cycle is going to be tailored uh, to your organization and your needs. And then the second aspect of smart goal setting relates to the actual KPI setting based on the lead life cycle that's associated with your business or your organization or your brand. So in this example over here, you can see that the top part, which is the uh, section in blue, talks about a very simplistic B2C life cycle. Now, it's a small organization. You have inquiries that are coming in. Inquiries are probably handled by a few salespeople, uh, perhaps under five salespeople or sales team members or perhaps by the business owner themselves. They get very quickly classified as either sales qualified leads or either qualified leads or they're not. And if they are, they, they move through the process and they go into the customer acquisition phase. If they're not qualified, they get dumped fairly quickly and eliminated from the process, they either go through uh, some sort of like in an automation stream if they still have potential to close in future, but otherwise if they don't really have potential, they're the wrong kind of leads, then they essentially get into a recycled pool. So that's a very simplistic B2C sort of a structure that we are talking about. And then in the second example, right below it, uh, the stuff mentioned in green uh, is really a lead life cycle that's associated with a typical B2B organization. So in that case, you have inquiries that are coming in. Now bear in mind that inquiries are gonna be generated from all different lead sources. You have inquiries coming in from direct, from social, referral, paid, organic, all of these different sources are bringing in inquiries to you. So the next step in the inquiry classification is really classifying them as MQLs or marketing qualified leads. MQL leads are by definition are leads that fit your persona, that fit your criteria. So these are leads that you're exactly looking for to acquire as customers. And then you have the other pool that's gonna be in the non-MQLs, which essentially are leads that are not really relevant for you because they don't fit that exact persona that you're looking for. So one of the questions that might come about over here is that why would we have to deal with MQLs? If, if they are not qualified leads, like why would they be coming in? And that's because, remember your inquiries are coming in from all quarters, like even direct referral organic sources, and you can't really control what type of leads are coming in from certain channels. Paid, yes, you can control, but a lot of the direct and organic you can't necessarily control. And that's why you might be having this flow of non-MQL leads that are coming in. So the MQL stage really is a stage where marketing still handling the leads. These are leads that fit the criteria. And then uh, they get passed on to the sales team at this stage, which is the sales accepted lead stage, the SAL stage. Here's where marketing officially hands the lead over to the sales team. Sales team takes the lead, starts to uh, engage in conversations with the leads and uh, starts to establish really trust, um, qualify them for time, interest and money and start to establish a pipeline associated with that lead. 
what from the SAL stage, you go to another stage, which is the SQL stage, the sales qualified lead stage. And here's where the sales team officially assigns a revenue pipe, a, pipe, a pipeline revenue that's associated with this particular opportunity. So the SQL status is where the lead is very highly engaged, highly qualified. There's a pipeline that's associated with this lead. And at this stage, the leads really being managed on the sales CRM side. And there might be other process steps that are associated from the SQL state to the new customer state. Um, you might have, you know, proposal initiated, proposal sent, follow up, second follow up, third follow up, et cetera, et cetera. You might have all of these different uh, stages, lead stages that are created in the sales CRM. Uh, so that can get tracked as well. Uh, but to keep things simple, from the SQL stage, uh, the sales team is really going to define them either as a new customer acquisition, a win for the organization, or for whatever reason, which could be a variety of reasons, they don't become new customers and they get bounced back into the MQL stage for further nurturing uh, opportunities with that, with that lead. So maybe the timing wasn't right. And if that is the case, they go back into the MQL pool. The marketing team has uh, nurturing or engagement strategies in place uh, to keep these leads engaged. And then when the time is right, they get pushed on back to the sales team. So these are like your typical lead lifecycle examples when it comes to B2B and B2C. They can be super sophisticated when it comes to organizations, depending on the level of maturity as far as the, uh, the overall marketing structure is concerned. And then once we have these lead life cycles defined, identified, then we go essentially to the next step. So Peter, if you could just go to the next slide. Terrific. So now what you want to do is that you want to assign targets for each of these different process steps. You can either utilize these targets that are internal benchmarks, or you can utilize best of breed benchmarks. So over here, uh, Sirius is showing us uh, some average, strong, and best in class metrics that are associated with the different lead lifecycle stages. We can use that as reference, or we could uh, primarily use our past historic benchmarks as reference, because let's say our industry is so niche, let's say we're in aviation or manufacturer or something, it's, it's a very specific focused vertical, and our data would be really different. So we can, we can either use our, our industry, like our past benchmark or this industry data that's, that's out there for us to utilize. And what this allows us to do, once we really classify the lead lifecycle data, then we go into the next step. And the next step now is really the target definition or the target identification. Sorry, Peter, if you could just go to the next slide, please. Awesome. So, you see what we're doing here in the smart goal setting. We identified our lead life cycle. Once we identified it, we established percentages for the lead life cycle, uh, either on benchmarks or on our past performance. And now what we're doing is that we are gonna do a little bit of math because we are gonna reverse engineer the entire lead life cycle to come up with a specific number that we need uh, from our tactics, from our lead acquisition tactics in order to get the results that we're looking for. So in this case, as far as this example is concerned, let's say the overall company-wide revenue target is five mil. Uh, the, the contribution for digital towards this revenue is 40% because you might have other sources that are contributing to revenue, whether it's distributors or direct sales that are coming in. So if it's 40%, uh, then you're essentially looking at a revenue contribution by digital at, at two mil. Let's say the average deal size is 20,000. So basically the total number of sales that you need to hit your revenue contribution is going to be a hundred sales. I'm just doing a bit of math. So uh, apologies again, because there's a bit more math and I promise you that's the only math we have in this uh, presentation deck. So we have the, the, the sales number now, right? Which is this number here, the hundred mark. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start reversing this based on our lead life cycle, as well as the different percentages that we have. So if we know that our, the, our, our number of wins, our number of sales that's, that's needed is uniquely 100, and let's say we know that our sales qualified lead to, uh, to one ratio is 20%, that means we need 500 sales qualified leads in order to get 100, 100 deals. So we keep reversing the number. If we know that our sales accepted lead to our sales qualified lead ratio is 65%, that means we need 770 sales accepted leads in order to get these 500 SQLs. So we keep going backwards. So if we know that our MQL to our SAL ratio is 75%, that means we need just over about a thousand leads in order to get our 770 sales accepted leads. 
And then if we know that our lead to MQL ratio is 10%, that's really what we're averaging, then we need to generate uh, uh, 10,000 plus leads in order to get the 1,000 plus MQLs that we are looking for. And then we can also assign a budget number to this because if we have past data for cost per lead numbers or metrics, we can use that or we can use industry averages to uh, really uh, incorporate a CPL metric that's associated with it, which is then going to give us a total budget. So in this instance, we are looking at a budget of just over 400K that's gonna produce two mil in uh, revenue for this organization. Now, we're not gonna get into lifetime value uh, calculations and stuff for the sake of this discussion, but that, just to kind of explain to you as to how we can organize smart goal setting for organizations and give them a very clear idea of uh, what are some of the budgets or numbers that are needed in order to hit their overall revenue goals uh, that have been assigned. And um, it's so important to calculate this um, uh, and uh, it just puts everything in a, in a nice perspective for an organization. Sometimes, I, I just wanna add this bit that sometimes you wanna look at your total budget number as being a pretty big number and it's scary. Do remind the organization or remind yourselves as marketers that look, you don't have to start with 400K. You're gonna start with a monthly test budget. So you're gonna break that 400K down into monthly budgets can be 5K, 6K, whatever the case is and then you're gonna scale this approach as you're seeing results that are coming in. So in the planning process and the blueprint, when you're putting your numbers down, it's very important to remind all the key stakeholders that look, you don't have to write a check for 400K right now. We're gonna start with like five or six K or 10K, whatever the case is, whatever your risk appetite is. And then we're gonna scale this as we're seeing traction when it comes to our tactical steps. Just wanted to add that. Uh, Peter, do you wanna take the personas? Sure, sure. Um, so in order to, so, so we're talking about marketing qualified leads and the pieces that we need to do is we really need to identify in detail who that persona is, who are you really trying to sell to? And, and it's plural because it's not just one person. And it, it, if it's an insurance company, it could be I'm brokering with other insurances and that helps me versus the direct to consumer. Um, I've worked with nonprofits and it's the person receiving the mission statement or the corporate sponsors that's donating fundraiser or like a, a association like Habitat for Humanity. They need corporate sponsors. They need volunteers to big the house and they need to find people that will receive that house. So it was one of the most crucial steps before you do anything else is to get down in the mind of what all the different personas are. And I mean, putting a picture to it what are they, uh, you know, what, what's their name like? Where do they go to school? How much are they making? What kind of car they drive? What drives them? What do they like? What do they don't like? So when you define this and you're making content or you're building uh, uh, ebooks or whatever, you can say, who is this piece of material uh, content for? Is it for Jane? Is it for Paul? Uh, you can match it up with each one of your personas and then you say, yeah, I have that. And I think doing this, really defines um, how you're going to get the right marketing, the right leads, because you can't market to everybody, because if you market to everybody, you market to no one. Yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of points there, Peter. In this post-COVID world, it's so important to just go back and revisit your personas, because you'd be surprised. All the data and metrics have changed. So to give you a couple of simple examples of what we're seeing as far as a pivot and persona approach is a concern, one is that um, Pre-COVID, it was a very mobile-centric world. Uh, everybody in the industry, especially on the SEO side, was talking about mobile-first indexing, and everybody is moving towards a mobile experience. It was all about that. Um, uh, guess what? Desktops bounce back, and it's bounced back strong. And why is that? Is because our work habits have changed. So we are now working from home uh, more than we're working in an office environment. In an office environment, your browsing habits are more geared towards mobile devices. Whereas at home, when you're working, you don't wanna be working out of your cell phone. Most likely you're working out of a desktop interface and you are multitasking. You're also browsing websites. You're kind of like doing your own thing at the same time as well. And, um, and you'll see that this has really shaped and impacted uh, personas massively. So now all the advertising and all the, uh, the marketing that was essentially geared towards a mobile first experience has to now shift to also cater to desktop experiences because the behavior shifted for people post-COVID. They are 
um, we are seeing a lot of um, shift as far as uh, the, the desktop and mobile usage is concerned when we're looking at uh, analytics uh, for our clients and customers. Yeah. Uh, the, sorry, go ahead, Peter. Well, the other thing I would add is, is risk averse. Like how risk averse do you think this persona is? Are they the type of person that's going to be the early adopter going back out into the, the, the bars and the restaurants, or are they going to hold back and they're going to still do takeout or are they going to do more uh, order online, pick up a curb, right? That's another aspect that we're seeing we, sh we need to place into the persona development. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And to add to that, uh, the average time of day and then the average and the and the best time of day rather and the best times of the week, the best days of the week are two metrics that have also shifted dramatically. Just wanted to give a shout out to these two metrics for everybody to look at this data once again, because what you thought were your best days of the week to sell have changed 100% because people are now consuming information and doing conversions at all uh, at times of the day, it's 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 definitely pivoted, shifted, and then the second uh, uh, metric, which is your best time of the day for conversions, is also switched and shifted because now uh, you're not in a traditional nine to five environment anymore. So if your best time for conversions was after hours because people uh, finished work, then they came in based on your product, your experience. That's when they were doing most of their conversions. Has now shifted because those conversions can happen during regular normal work hours as well. So it's very important to go back into your analytics instance and review the uh, these two data sets because you might be spending money incorrectly uh, based on your past persona habits. Uh, so that needs to change. Great. So we've done smart goal setting, we've done personas, and now we go into content mapping. Uh, did you want to tackle this, uh, Peter? Or I can continue whatever you prefer. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just um, being conscious of the time. Okay, sounds good. So in terms of content mapping, so you got the smart goals done, you got the personas identified and down back, now you go into content mapping. And here's where you wanna make sure that your content is catering to your personas. And uh, personas, as we know, have the, their entire life cycle, whether it's the awareness consideration, uh, the decision stage, you wanna make sure that when you're mapping your content, you have content that resonates with each persona and at each stage. And the tip over here is to make sure that you do this exercise, not just for yourself, but for your competitors as well. So you can kind of see how are they addressing these three life um, uh, uh, stages in, in a typical customer's journey as compared to your content. So you will find gaps, you'll, uh, and that's where the content gap analysis comes in, where you need to solidify your approach and your content in some of these sections because it's, it's, uh, it's needing improvement. And then you do that same exercise for your competitors so you can really understand and see when you're plotting out your content uh, calendar, what are the areas that you need to focus on and what are some of the topics that you need to incorporate because your competitor is doing it and you wanna be pushing better content than your competitors. So the content mapping step, which is step three, is all about uh, really making sure that you have the best possible content out there for each of the uh, uh, life cycle stages that are associated with a typical customer. Yeah, I'll just add one piece that I heard recently in a podcast. Two personas, a marathon runner and a first time runner, two different people. Content, you don't want to be sending like what it's like to be a first time runner to the marathon runner. That, you know, that's what you need to be thinking about when you're writing the content, you need to match to the persona because that marathon runner is figuring out, I know we have one on the call, you know, how to long, long distance. Well, that first time runner is just like, hey, it's COVID. I'm trying to get exercise because the gym is closed. How do I start? Yeah. So that, that's a kind of an example of how to map content to their particular persona. Yeah, that's, that's a really important point, Peter. Yeah, a lot of the times uh, organizations push out generic content uh, and uh, miss the important aspect that there's different persona types that the content needs to cater for. Yeah. And then you and it tunes off and people don't engage. Absolutely. Oh, Menti. Um, uh, so this one should be a quick one. I apologize for having to uh, stop share. Uh, share. So our next mentee is how successfully have you pivoted your strategy post COVID? Yes no needs improvement or in progress so if we can get people to start to um, 
uh, answer that. Uh, let's get some results. I know we got a good amount of people on. Uh, we got about 30 people on the call. Let's see, see if we can do better than the other one. Well, we're seeing some needs improvement, which I, I agree. It's uh, you know definitely a um, work in progress because you know stuff is opening and then closing. Uh, this is very interesting times for marketers. Yeah, and you can keep the Menti open on on your device. Um, it's not gonna. It's always the same number. Um, if you forgot it, it's still menti.com, and there's the code 792696. Actually, I can paste that in the chat in case anybody. Yeah, let's do another refresh. Oh. That shouldn't have happened. I'm sorry. Somehow I accidentally closed it. So if you, you still, I'll give you another uh, 10 seconds to vote. Somehow the voting automatically got closed. Okay, we're gonna switch back to the PowerPoint, continue with our discussion. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. So just to recap, we've done smart goal setting, we've done personas, we've done content mapping, and now the fourth step really is the offer step. And uh, I can't stress the importance in upper offers because offers can really make or break the overall uh, campaign that you're putting out there. And I'd love to use this analogy because it's such a good analogy. We, we had a, a financial services client that came to us that was totally like disappointed with digital marketing, uh, had spent a ton of money and uh, we're just literally like giving up on digital marketing saying, look, this stuff doesn't work. It, it's not getting us any results. Uh, it's not uh, making a difference as far as our campaigns are concerned. And uh, we decided to do a bit of a deep dive. So they had an offer. The offer was a free financial consultation, which, hey, is an offer. I mean, it is something out there. It's not nothing. And um, we went a little bit deeper. And what we discovered was that in their radius, um, in, in their advertising zone, where they were really focusing on, as far as their geo target was concerned, they had 15 other competitors. Uh, and guess what their offer was? Free financial consultation. So imagine you have this limited ad space. And in this ad space, you're putting out an offer uh, that when you're writing your ad copy, every single ad copy is talking about this free financial consultation, free financial con consultation, sign up here. Everybody is essentially doing the same thing. Um, so no surprise that their conversion rates are fairly mediocre and none at all in certain campaigns because everybody was essentially just regurgitating the same stuff that was out there. So when we took a bit of a deeper dive into what this organization actually did as a part of the free consultation, it was... It was amazing. So what they did was that they actually looked at your financial portfolio and the rate of return that you're getting today. And they would then assess uh, based on their algorithms and their uh, a proprietary interface that they had, they were able to give you a sort of a forecast on what your rate of return would be if you invested the funds with them. So if you're getting, let's say a 6% or 5% rate of return, uh, they could then forecast and say, look, you come with us, and they push the uh, the overall approach in broad strokes, not giving out their secret sauce, but basically saying, look, if you do this with us, we're going to look at a nine or a 10% rate of return, which was amazing. So all we had to do was to really understand what they were doing in that free consultation. We tweaked the offer to get your personalized financial blueprint complimentary and no prizes for guessing which offer was working better. Here you go to market with a free financial consultation offer, or you go to market with get your personalized financial blueprint, complimentary. So the, the work from the client end wasn't changing, but we essentially changed the wording of the offer. And there's, that's where marketing creativity comes in as well. But just to stress the importance of this step four, which is really the offer step, you want to go to market with a strong offer, because if your offer isn't strong, it doesn't matter how good your marketing efforts are, you're not going to get 
the best ROI from your campaigns than if you have a really powerful offer that you go to market with. So step four is really all about pushing the right offers out there. And once you have step four that's essentially completed, then you go into the next stage or the next step, uh, which really is conversion paths. And um, this is a pretty interesting step as well because you, you've done your smart goals, you've done your personas, you've done your content mapping, you have the right offer in place. And now what you wanna make sure is you wanna control the visitor experience uh, as they come to your website. So one of the things that marketers hate, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this, are just you know a bunch of mavericks coming to the website and they're just clicking everywhere. And like, you know, hey, let me go to the about page. Let me go to your product page. Let me go to your services page. Let me go to your contact page. Where's your location? Like they're all over. And you don't want that because you're not really able to understand visitor experience uh, despite putting in like heat map tracking, whether you're using Hotjar, Crazy Egg, whatever you're using. Uh, you wanna be able to control the conversion path. You wanna basically guide visitors in a certain path based on what you wanna push and promote in your website. And here's where the conversion path analytics comes in, conversion path optimization or CRO or conversion rate optimization comes in. And the uh, digital industry has really adapted this from uh, the traditional uh, industry. And this is something that the traditional industry can definitely take uh, credit for uh, because you have the grocery stores that have been doing this for the longest time. So when you walk into a grocery store, it's no surprise that you have your, your, your uh, featured items or certain items that are close to the cash registers. Uh, and another amazing analogy, because I do have an 18 month old is, you know, you kind of wonder sometimes why their favorite cereal boxes are kept like in the lowest aisle, like, you know, the, the Marvel characters and you gotta like really bend and pick up those cereal boxes. And that's because you are not the target audience right? Your kid is. So are they going to cater to your eye level? Or are they going to cater to your kid's eye level? And obviously your kid's eye level. They want, that's their target audience when it comes to those cereal boxes. And that's why they keep them or position them in a certain aisle. So we've taken a page off uh, what the traditional, like, you know, the grocery stores have been doing for the longest time, things like stat counters, uh, seeing heat maps and lanes, uh, and then pricing and placing and positioning a products accordingly. If we want to take the same analogy on our website and we want to make sure that whatever offer that we have is front and center on the website so we control the journey, we control the experience as opposed to uh, people essentially doing whatever they want to do on the website. So step five uh, is all about getting your website ready and primed for the next step, which we're now going to go into. And that's really the tactical step. And this is also really interesting because uh, when we as consultants go in and we educate clients on, hey, tactics are great, but here's five steps that you really need to hone in on prior to going tactical, uh, it really sort of like blows them away and it, and, and it sets us apart as consultants and marketers because nobody's really sort of like taking the time to really educate them in the entire process in, a, in, a, in such a simplistic manner. So they get it, they understand it, that there's certain uh, core aspects that need to be lined up before you start going into uh, the uh, actual tactical side of things. So when you're looking at step six, uh, so Peter, we can go to the uh, step six slide, which is um, uh, all about tactics. So that's going to be the next one. Yeah, I just want, you know, so I, I don't want to gloss over the conversion path. I mean, this is really important. Once you've figured everything out, you want to make sure we're that you know where people are dropping off and what sure. might need to be improved. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. that's where Google Analytics goals and, and it comes into handy uh, to identify that. Absolutely, absolutely. Sorry, six. Perfect, so the step six is really now where you're defining your tactics. And this is where you sort of like take your tactics or you break down tactics by lead source. You put some KPIs, assign some projections and forecasts and metrics that are associated with your spend levels for these different tactics, conversion rates, average CPC, click-throughs, cost per conversion. So here's where you're doing your tactical forecasting. You're identifying lead sources and channels that you really wanna be utilizing as far as pushing your marketing spends are concerned. And the tactical side, it can be done based on, again, past experience. So here's where you lend on uh, expert, expertise of consultants like ourselves and many others that have joined this call um, based on their background, their personal background, their personal experiences. You don't want to be making the same mistakes. And that's where the consulting expertise comes in to identify the right blend or the right mix of lead sources in order to get you the uh, conversions or, or the results that you're looking for. 
So step six, all about tactical planning and projections for the results that you're looking at. And then you want to be closing out step seven with uh, a very strong closed loop reporting structure in place. And this is another area that's such an area of improvement for organizations, because I can tell you eight times out of 10, when we walked into organizations and we've tried to identify leads, lead stages, um, historical data associated with leads, it's a big fail uh, because they either have too many systems uh, that the leads are passing through that are not communicating with each, each other. So you'll have the marketers are going to have their CMS, whether it's HubSpot or, or SharpSpring or, or, you know, Eloqua, Marketo, Salesforce, Marketing Cloud, whatever you're, you're using. So you're, have, you're having your leads being tracked over there. And then the sales side has their own interface when it comes to lead management on the sales side. And a lot of the times we see that the two systems are not talking. There's no pipeline revenue reporting that's built in. There's no marketing dashboards or sales dashboards that are established that are giving an, a holistic overall view of what's really happening uh, within uh, the overall organization and the lead flow. So it's very important to incorporate closed loop reporting. And the holy grail of closed loop reporting is really when you can literally take a lead at any stage or any step, and you can see the chronological order of uh, all the interaction that the leads had with you and your organization and your brand. Uh, how much time did it spend on the content? What type, was, uh, type of content was produced? What's the interaction that's been with the lead? Any sort of feedback that we've gotten for the lead? Uh, progressive profiling that's associated with the lead so that we can understand the lead characteristics and lead profile better. So that's really the holy grail where you can go into any system, any interface, and at any point pull all of this information that's associated with that lead history. So the idea is to really get to that level of sophistication uh, on the reporting aspects and the reporting end. So yeah, that's essentially what we wanted to cover today as far as our overall blueprint is concerned. Uh, Megan, not sure if you wanted to add a couple of words uh, based on your experiences. Um, uh, I, I'm sure you're experiencing a lot of digital transformation uh, on your end right now. So um, yeah, I would love to hear your perspectives. We also have a wrap up uh, mentee. Um, Perfect. Yeah, sure. Feel free to transition over to that, Peter. I'll uh, I'll keep things brief, but I, I think this is a wonderful framework, Vinish. Thanks for sharing this with the group today. Um, I think what we're seeing a lot is during times where you have to pivot as an organization, um, lots of marketers uh, run into challenges sticking to the basics and really being tactical. I think it's, it's it, a lot of, particularly I liked your slide at the beginning with the B2B companies because I think that's a particular area of challenge where folks um, are, are getting directives to innovate and push out new content and they're forgetting to do things like look at how their leads are coming in or even uh, test different messaging for the same content really going back to the fundamentals I think is important right now so. Uh, true. so which aspects of the seven steps that we went over on do you need to focus on most? So we should be able to, so it should come up on your phone. Um, and then it, it's a multi, you can select multiple. Yeah. Uh, Wow, seems like a real mix here, huh? I think for me, it's definitely personas. So that was a healthy reminder for me during my day job, for sure. <laughs> well, I mean, it, you know, as, as president of AMA, you know, so, again, I think that plays into it. Yeah. Right, when we're writing content. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think your point earlier, Vanish, that, that they really shift. A lot of these benchmarks have shifted and we can't just keep doing the same old thing. I think, uh, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of companies I've seen have been, I don't know if you found this, have been very good at um, maybe shifting their messaging or um, figuring out what they want to say that's different, but they may not be looking at um, the, the data differently, which I think is an important point. Yeah, for sure. Megan. I think the, the pivot of like uh, desktop bouncing back was like, I'm a bit of a traditionalist and I, you know, I love my desktop. I, you know, I, I guess I love my cell phone, but I also like my nice big screen and to see 
uh, that bouncing back and percentages shifting uh, with us wanting to focus more back on the desktop experience was interesting, more so from a UI UX standpoint, because everything's being designed mobile first, but um, now we also have to cater to a desktop usage as well. So that was, that was interesting. Terrific. Well, did we want to uh, invite people yeah. to ask questions at this point, guys? Yeah, so um, the last thing I wanted to be able to offer both Venetia and I is, you know, we're, we, we know this is a very difficult, um, a, you know, difficult situation for all businesses. I don't care if you're B2C, B2B, you know, small, large, everybody's trying to figure out how we're going to get through the, the next day. And basically what we came up with, we really want to sit down and have a complimentary, you know, discovery call and understand your unique situation and the, the issues that you're having for your particular business. So there's a question um, that you can put your contact information in. Uh, and so we can reach out and have that 30 minute discovery call with you. Uh, yeah, you have to do it while this uh, poll is up because after I shut down this poll, you want to have that option. But we do have a, a question that came in while people are doing that. Um, how do you strategize content on your organization's social media channels are you, as you are targeting multiple personas that are different stages in their buying cycles? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So I think the analogy of really plotting out your content calendar based on personas plays out not just for your website, but for your social media channels as well. So when you're classifying content, what you want to be doing is you want to also classify content based on the medium that you're going to be pushing the content out. So when you're doing your content calendars based on the personas, you want to plot out uh, what's going to be pushed uh, based on which medium. So like, for example, uh, the content on the website is going to be very different from your social media outlets. So when you're doing a LinkedIn post, it's going to be a sort of a, a different messaging because it's a different audience as compared to a Facebook or a Twitter post um, or other social media channels for that matter. But all of that can really be plotted out in this, the third step, which is the content mapping step. Because in the content mapping step, you're not just doing the topics, you're also doing topics specific to channels uh, because uh, the the um, the messaging really varies based on the channel. Right. Oh, I forgot to mention the reason for the picture is the balls in your court, right? That's why. <laughs> There's a great picture that I was like going through some of our uh, pictures for our website. Um, but yeah, this is not a sales call. This is a call so we can understand your business and help you. Right? That's what we're all trying to do. We're all in this together to try to help each other out. Uh, you know, I believe AMA is trying to educate people. We're trying to you know, help AMA in any way we can. Um, or we're trying to help businesses. We're all trying to stay around for the next you know, years. It's really, really affects me when I see so many local businesses in my town, they're just you know, closing shop. In large businesses, JCPenney, Sears, all of them, you know, that they're, I guess going by the way of Blockbuster, they're not adapting. They're not figuring it out. If anyone wants to um, throw their video on and ask a question that way, we'd welcome you to do that or throw something in the chat. Um, maybe, Peter, we could, when you're ready, go back to just the, yeah, the video view so that we could see yeah. if I have a question. A little more interpersonal. we got to get facile with all the, the Zoom uh, social skills here. <laughs> I was going to mention that. There's some interesting. Uh, well, and Zoom changes their, their, I was like, I couldn't, I wanted to share the whole desktop and it wouldn't allow me to. I don't know why. Yeah. You got to just expect a few uh, road bumps, I think, along the way, but take them in stride. Yeah. So I see a couple of people turn their video on. Did we have some questions or anything in the chat? Uh, yes, I, I've got something. Uh, Kim Burkhardt here. Sure. It's just, uh, it's, it's an observation. I, I was a, a I was a, uh, potential client recently with a company that made a mistake and I don't want anybody else to make the same mistake. I, I called in, I wanted to, uh, well, and the story was it was a real estate office. Um, I was writing a book about that they had a house that was on the market to be sold. Um, I was writing a book about the original owner because it was an ancestor and I wanted the realtor to let me in to show, to, 
and show me the house so that I could take photos and they could use it. They could use that in their sales pitch of, hey, there's a book being written about this house, about the original owners. But when I called in, I didn't meet their qualifications of like, I hadn't been pre-approved for a mortgage. I hadn't this, I hadn't that. So they refused to have a realtor phone me because I wasn't pre-qualified. I, was, I didn't meet their, their qualified lead. Well, they missed out on, a, on, on getting information that they could have used to help sell the house. So my lesson is if you've, uh, it's great to have marketing qualified leads, but don't do it in such a way that you exclude opportunities. Yeah, that's a great point, Kim. I think, uh, you know, a lot of us forget to humanize the leads and really <laughs> dig in from a person, uh, person right. to person perspective. I think that's why it's so important to not automate and systematize everything. Um, yeah. Well, Exactly. And for me, it's, um, I'm always willing to have a 15 minute discussion. And then, you know, I'll choose if it's not a fit or not. But I mean, to have a 15 minute discussion out of my day with, you know, somebody I might be able to help or I might be able to refer to. Um, mm -hmm. It's I think that's just being human and being authentic. You don't know further down the road and you might be spoiling a relationship. Great. Any other questions from our audience today? Thank you for joining. Um, this has been a really great conversation. Thank you, Venetian. and thank you, Peter, and the whole team. I'm, I'm sorry, I got uh, pinged by Helen. <laughs> um, I got to share the slide about upcoming events. I apologize. Yeah, we should probably wrap. That's why. Great. Well, I, I, that's why I stopped the share. Sorry. All good. Um, so there's my contact information if you need to reach out. And just jot that down um, quickly. Uh, and, and I'm on the board, uh, so you just go to amaboston.org. Uh, my LinkedIn is there too. Yeah, I'm very accessible. Um, I, Helen, do you want to do this or you want me to do this? Um, yeah, I can go ahead and uh, just let everyone know. So Peter and Vinish, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation and everyone for attending today's uh, webinar. This is such a great insight and learning. And I wanted to share, I'm VP of Programming for AMA Boston, and we are having really amazing events coming up. So before everyone leaves, I hope you can make some of them. Uh, we're having uh, a new launch of a series of five star uh, side chats. Uh, they're gonna be moderated by Larry Gulko, uh, top uh, marketer. And our guest speaker is gonna be the CEO of Ritz Carlton Yacht Collection. So I thought I wanted to share um, these with all of you and obviously our uh, wonderful marketing mingles. Um, the next one, we're gonna also have a top uh, speaker. It's gonna be Scott Brown, CMO of Drizzly. So we are very excited and thank you so much for uh, joining today. Uh, please uh, fill out the survey, let us know what um, you want and how things are going and we are here to listen to our audience. Thank you. <laughs>